in the first session of this learning creative learning course, we talked about some of the key cornerstones of creative learning. And we talked about the four P's of projects, peers, passion, and play. So this week we're gonna focus on projects. And, and that seems fitting. The two of us, we've worked together on lots of projects in the last 20 years. Uh, yeah, and most of those projects were really about spaces or tools to help young people create their own projects. Yeah, so I do think there's was projects about projects. <laughs> yeah. and I think that's what's important because I think our ultimate goal is how can we help kids engage in creating projects? Because I think we've seen over the years that a lot of the best learning experiences happen as kids are working on and creating their own projects. So today we want to talk about what does it mean to be creating your own project and what's the learning that comes out as you work on a project. Um, I think it's good maybe to start with some concrete examples. Yeah, and I was thinking since there's this video you've shown for many years and it, I was thinking there's probably a reason that you continue to show it even though we have newer work. Yeah, yeah. It, it is true. I do show this video a lot and sometimes people give me a hard time. But I think it captures some of the, the spirit of why I see projects as so important. It was a video that was made at the end of a two-week workshop uh, during the summer. It was probably like 15 years ago now. And it was a group of girls, I think they were like you know, 10 to 13 years old. Uh, and we were trying out some of the early versions of our programmable bricks that we worked on with the Lego company, where kids could program these blocks to make their you know, creations come alive, to react to things, and to move in the world. Uh, and we set up a workshop where we asked this group of girls uh, to think about inventing something that could be useful to them in their everyday lives, something that they really could make, that they wanted to make use of. So there was a group of people supporting them over this two weeks, and at the end of the two weeks, a local TV station came and made a video of what the girls had created uh, during the two weeks. Let's watch the video, and it would be great if everybody could think about the, you know, what they see is the experience that the girls were going through, and then we'll talk about it after watching the video. Yeah, see? It just beeps. Christina Costa is trying to build a better mouse trap. Make that gerbil trap. Every time they want to go inside this gerbil house, they press this light sensor. It's one of the many inventions created at this free math and science camp run by the Computer Museum and the Girl Scouts, where girls from Boston are devising everything from an odometer for rollerblades to a diary security system. When someone touches this to try to open the diary, it'll take a picture of that person. So like if your little brother tries to read your diary? Yeah. He's on camera. Yes. <laughs> Every time I watch that video, I just love watching that video. Uh, so if I think about you know, why is that I, I like it so much, I do think it captures for me you know, the rich learning that goes on when, when people, kids in particular, are creating things that they really care about. You could see in each of those examples, the girls were creating something that was really meaningful to yeah, them. Yeah, like it was her gerbil, right? So she had a question about her gerbil, and the fact that she even brought it to the workshop really made it come alive. You're right. It wasn't just building a house for any old gerbil, but she really cared about you know, that gerbil. And in fact, uh, I don't, this wasn't shown in the video, but I remember that she instrumented the door. She wanted to have it have a nice door so the gerbil could automatically go in and out and the door would open automatically. But then she wanted to know what was the gerbil doing at night while she was asleep. Mm -hmm. So she actually had the computer keep track of every time the, the door opened and shut. So she could wake up in the morning and find out what was the gerbil doing while she was asleep. Or during the school day, what was the gerbil doing while she was away at school? And in fact, she found out the gerbil had these bursts of activity. It would go in and out, in and out for like five minutes, and then do nothing for an hour. So it's a way to her to make connections with something, uh, you know, a, a, a different, you know, one of her pets that she really cared about. Yeah. And I guess and then in the, the diary one was also her diary. and But it looked like she was working with a friend on that one. So yeah. Right? Yeah, so and we do see that a lot with these design projects. It is something where, you know, working together with others is part of that design process, that it's not just, in fact, when we have the creative learning spiral here, that share is part of it, that it's sharing the experience, working together with others. And I think we saw at that workshop, you know, that they were going through that whole process of doing, of designing, you know, with, with others. Uh, and that create part, clearly all of them, 
you know, whether it was the gerbil house or the diary, you know, they were creating something. And I think that's something that's influenced a lot of the projects we've worked on together. It's something that we, I think, were influenced by Seymour Papert, who always talked about the importance of kids learning by designing things in the world. And it could be all different types of things, but that design process gives you opportunities to you make something in the world, and then that gives you new ideas. And then you have new ideas, and you make something new in the world. And we, we see that happening here. And I guess in, in the contrast that Seymour Papert made between that construction and instruction, right? Constructionism and instructionism. And I think we still see that kind of conflict and I hear some pushback against project-based learning because people say, well, often they're making projects, but they're not, they don't really end up learning anything. But, but I do think that, uh, and of course, there could be some projects where kids aren't learning so much. On the other hand, for me, the context of working on a project, first of all, it's going to be a bit more motivating and meaningful for kids to be learning things. So I think I would agree that it's important for kids to be, there's a whole range of things we want kids to be learning. But I think they're going to make the deeper connection to those ideas if it's in the context of something they care about. Like the rollerblades. Yeah, the rollerblades is a good example. Yeah. Because, again, I remember from that story, so, like, the girl who worked on that, she loved rollerblading. Uh, so she immediately thought of using rollerblades in the project, and then she put a sensor on the wheel so that every time it went around, it would detect a revolution of the wheel. So it could keep track of how far she went and how fast she went. Uh, but what she really wanted to know is how fast was she going in miles per hour? Because mm -hmm. she would ride in the car with her parents and how, you know, and she would see the car was going, you know, 30 miles per hour, 40 miles per hour. And she wanted to know how fast was she going? But the sensor just gave revolutions per second. Mm -hmm. It was a little magnetic sensor that would record each time it went around. But she wanted to know how could she change revolutions per second to miles per hour? And she spent a lot of time at the workshop trying to make that conversion. Now, I'm not sure, but I think that in school, she must have already gone through the math of that, but she probably wasn't paying attention of doing that type of unit conversion, of how to convert one type of units to another, because probably when it was introduced in school, it didn't really have meaning for her. It was just a, a school exercise. Uh, but Like fractions totally out of context, or multiplication, yeah. Yeah, so, but here she really it. wanted to learn it, so she was really motivated. Uh, and I think that because of, she really wanted to know how fast she was going, she learned how to do that conversion. I think we've seen over the years that when kids learn in that way, when they learn in the context of something they really care about, that they make a deeper connection with those ideas and can continue to relate it to other situations as well. Yeah, I often see, I feel like so many kids, the whole number line concept is just so abstract. If you just do it on paper, they don't get what it is. But then once they're doing it, when they're creating an animation, or trying to figure out how far they want their um, contraption to go, then they, they it just starts to make sense that bigger numbers are a further distance away. And But, I mean, a lot of them, it's amazing how many of them just have a blank stare. because it, it And that's one of the things that really motivates me about working with the young people is to see them start to experiment with time and numbers in a way that's meaningful in terms of time and distance where they really see it. And it's something that they're trying to make, right? It's not just giving them that challenge, but actually they're trying to make something and then they encounter something where it's a meaning. Yeah, actually that reminded me, using the same technology, I remember one workshop where a kid made a little car and he was programming the car to go backwards and forwards. And he said like, you know, repeat twice, you know, go forward and turn around. So it would go forward and then back. And they said three times, and go forward, back, forward. And then, you know, five times, go forward, back, forward, back, forward. And all of a sudden you realize, he said, oh, when I put in an odd number, it ends up away from where I started. When I put in an even number, it comes back to where I started. He said, so that's why they're even and odd numbers. <laughs> and, you know, so for him, you know, again, it had just been a, you know, meaningless, you know, added math fact that he had learned in his math classroom. But then we could put it to use yeah. about, you know, about why it was useful to, to know those sorts of things. Uh, I, I think this is a challenge, though. Again, I think we've worked on a lot of tools to engage kids and work on projects. But it's sometimes frustrating. We'll see those tools get used in classrooms in a different way than we imagined. That a lot of times... Uh, even if someone says they're doing a project-based approach, it might be, okay, today everyone's going to build 
a robotic car, here are the instructions, and at the end you'll be evaluated on how well your robotic car works. And the kids dutifully follow the instructions and they're evaluated on how well their car works. Uh, and that is making, they're creating something. Mm -hmm. But in our mind, that's not the spirit of what we see as a project-based and not the spirit of what Seymour would call constructionism. It wasn't just about constructing things, but constructing things you care about, experimenting with it, trying new things. And often the way that well, we've often done workshops, right, where either educators or young people are creating something, and we often start with some kind of a theme, right? So there's some theme, but then within that, people get their own ideas. Yeah. I, I think the same is said, you know, these days, I think some of the things that we saw in the video are very much in the spirit of today's maker movement, of kids using different materials to create things in their world that, yeah. that they care about. I think it's the same point, although it's called the maker movement, the real heart of the movement involves much more than just making. Yeah. That if you just make a robotic car by instructions, that's not the spirit of the maker movement. Yeah, and it, sometimes it is. It's like something you care about, something that's playful. It gets to some of the other P's, too, yeah. right? That yes, are important. Yes. Not projects alone, but right. passion play appears. Yeah, I think all of these things are, are yeah. interwoven. I think that's, this idea, of, I think it's still something that we work on a lot, thinking how can we help communicate to others that idea of how to you know, support projects in a way that uh, kids really do get to follow their own interest, to experiment, to have the full richness of the creative learning spiral. Yeah. I remember I saw a great example just a few months ago uh, with another of the Lego robotics kits, uh, the Lego Redo Robotics, which is a robotics kit for younger kids than Mindstorms. Uh, and again, to me, it's so important that it doesn't just get introduced in the classroom about use this to build, follow the instructions, build this and you're finished. Uh, I love the example I saw when I was visiting Uruguay in South America and they have a big nationwide project with computers in schools and they were introducing the robotics kit. And I loved, I saw a couple kids who would use the Lego We Do Robotics kit for, as part of a project about sugarcane farms. And sugarcane Farms is sort of the is with you know in their community that was what most of the economy was based on sugarcane farms, and they were creating a whole diorama based on sugarcane farms, and now that they had this new technology, they integrated it and started making interactive machines from the sugarcane farm. So this was a, probably a project-based approach that they've been using for a while, but they integrated the technology and it just naturally integrated to see how the different machines work. So it's something where across the disciplines, they were learning about sensors and feedback and programming, but they're learning in the context of a social studies unit where they were learning about their local culture and their, the local economy. Yeah, so I think that's it. Sometimes people think, because there's some cool tools, that we think the tool is really important, but sometimes they think if you just give the tool and you say, go for it, people can make projects. And if they've already been doing that for a while and they already have an idea, but often, again, that's where this context of a workshop or a makerspace where there's a, a lot of examples on the wall, right? There's a whole structure. There's people there to help you. There's different things that can help make that project come to life. Right? Yeah, right. There's a lot more to it than just the tools. To be, and trying to, although the tool's important. Yeah. I think some tools are going to be more likely to support the use of project to be engaged kids in projects. Right. And, and also and also to highlight certain concepts, right? Like in some of these that we've been talking about where numbers are useful, right? So and again it doesn't have to be numbers, right? There's other projects, but yeah. So there's sort of the, so I guess that leads to the question of how we can best support this project based approach, you know, you know, in different settings. And yeah. I often like to quote this line from John Dewey where he was talking about his progressive approach to education, which was a very project-based approach. Yeah. So it shared a lot of the spirit of what we've been talking about. Uh, and there's a line from one of Dewey's books where he said that his approach to education was simple but not easy. Mm -hmm. And I think he meant he could describe it. He was describing it in a little brochure, sort of like the four Ps. It's pretty simple to say four Ps. You know, what could be simpler than that? Yeah. But it's not easy to support it in educational settings and to support people learning. It requires the right types of tools, the right types of facilitators, the right approach for asking questions at the right time. In the video we showed earlier of the invention workshop, there were a lot of people behind the scenes. There were mentors there working with the kids. Yeah. So the projects were based on their interests, but it was mentors who helped kids think about their own interests and helped them think about how to follow through on their interests. Yeah, and work out the problem. So it'd be interesting to hear what people think about 
like remembering a project that they made either when they were a young person or more recently and what kind of structures or supports helped in the project? What were those things that were really important in order to make the project happen? I think that'd be a great thing. I'd love to read in the discussion forums, both, yeah, uh, basically for people's own experiences work on projects and the support structures to help support it. But then as they start introducing a lot of, there are a lot of educators, you know, involved with the course, for them to share some of their strategies for supporting uh, learning through projects, or if they're introducing new things, how they would, you know, take some of these ideas and try to support a project-based approach. So anyway, we really hope, 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 for it, hope that people will share some of those ideas, and we look forward to, to reading them and continuing the discussion.